Hey everybody, we are Francis, Martin, and Robert, and this is Snakes and Otters, a pointless discussion of eternal questions. Get ready, we're about to live in your head rent-free. Howdy folks, welcome back to Snakes and Otters. Uh, I am Francis in the captain's chair. I'm Martin. And I'm Robert. And uh, we're going to be doing this time a celebration and appreciation of Klingon culture, our first Star Trek episode. I have been wanting to do this for so long, guys. And we've been talking a long time about Klingons. We constantly talk about Klingons. We're quoting Klingons all the time. Or or Star Trek in general. That's right. Star Trek is one of those doors in which we all enter. Uh, It's very much baked into us. We are of that age. We were very small when the original Star Trek premiered. Eight, nine years old when when those episodes were on syndication syndication. in the early 70s. That's right. And that was formative to us in many, many ways. And young adults when Next Generation debuted. Absolutely. So we were one of the, we were early adopters. I mean, we were at your aunt's house for the premiere. We were. And uh, it was an amazing, because I had, my wisdom teeth were acting up. I still remember. Uh, <laughs> I can always tell you when I had my wisdom teeth out, because it was three days after that. That's right. As a matter of fact, uh, it was uh, just a few days ago that was the anniversary of that date. Isn't that it was amazing? October 3rd, I believe. That's right. It? Absolutely, yeah. yes. Uh, you got it. That's right. A lot A lot of things have... Uh... It's amazing the useless information the mind can call up. <laughs> well, when it comes to Star Trek, nothing is useless, as we all know. Uh, and, and, we, and we will do many other Star Trek episodes from time to time. Uh, it, it, it is peppered in everything we yeah. do very often. Uh, but this one is kind of the, the necessary one. The one that we wanted... Because we talk about this all the time because it almost didn't happen. An appreciation of Klingon culture. And people will say, oh, how geeky. But it's far deeper than that. It actually points out some great universal truths about the human condition, which all good stories should do. Right. And right. that's why we find it so fascinating. Yeah. And then that's, that's the thing about Star Trek and about, in particular, any Klingon threads in the episodes. It's good storytelling. That's right. It almost did everybody loves storytelling. That's right. That's, in many respects, that's what, that, that is, you could boil down the human condition. What is good about it? To the fact that we tell stories. That's why this well, podcast Well, that's what makes us different from every other creature. That is right. Is we tell stories. That's right. Yeah. And that's what makes life worth living in many ways. That's why this podcast is all about. We're telling stories in just different ways. Yeah. And the beauty of the Klingon culture, I think, is partially contained within its irony. Because it almost didn't happen. Uh, and just to kind of reach back. Yeah, there's that word again. Yes. Not reach around, but reach back. Uh, a little bit and... Remind everybody that the Klingons we know today had almost nothing, or almost nothing like, what was originally intended. Uh, they were intended basically to be simple, cardboard cutout villains. Uh, they were a, in many respects, this is still at the the waning of the Western genre. Uh, the height of it on television and right. movies. No, this, so, Roddenberry got his start in TV with like cop shows and and westerns and and, and that kind of well, early sixties. And it was drama. still very much that's what you did, and so that's that, what the producers wanted was a wagon train to the stars. That's right, and that's how he sold it originally. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, you needed Indians. <laughs> so that's what he's what he's doing here, and he's not. And he also needed cheap ones because uh, especially in Hollywood these days, you know, that's how you you know wigs and uh, and uh, Bows and arrows and horses, and you got you got Indians. That's kind of the way the Klingons were originally started. A little swarthy makeup and some pretty cheap costumes and a little bit of mustache twirling, uh, and that's what you got. They were also intended to be at that time because Indians were also stands in for Soviets during the Cold War. Yes, this is this there, it's all related. Well, you need of the Cold War. you need a very uh, melodramatic villain, a cultural yeah. villain. To yeah. work with, yeah, and, and they, that's what they came up with. Right, they served as a touchstone to the audience to relate to current events. That's right, uh, as an analog for the for the Soviets. Right, but the thing about the Klingons were, a Roddenberry didn't really create them. He had a little bit to do with them. He was, it was still first season when they came up with it. It was late in first season. It was Gene L. Kuhn who actually did the real work on this. But as we said, they were pretty much. They were totalitarian, militaristic, mean stuff. Yeah. They had the swarthy makeup. And part of this was sold in, in their first episode is the episode of Errand of Mercy with the wonderfully scene-chewing actor, John Colicos. <laughs> we remember him well because he was Baltar in the original 
Battlestar Galactica. And this guy, my lord, there's never a scene that he didn't know how to chew. He was amazingly fun in everything he did. He was larger than life. And he made a great foil for James Kirk, who was, of course, larger than life in many ways. So it made a great story. And uh, they realized, you know, these are these are pretty good. Let's keep bringing these folks back. But there's really only three episodes in that original series that you got. You've got Errand of Mercy. You had The Trouble with Tribbles, uh, which had William Campbell as Klingon captain. He didn't have a large role in there. But you've got the whole bar fight scene and uh, the Klingons insulting Scotty and stuff. And it, 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 that added a little bit more to the mythos. And then later on in the third season, you have the great uh, actor Michael and Sara. Uh, played Klingon Captain Kang and he and Kirk kind of go at it in this episode and you get a little bit of wait a minute these guys are militaristic you didn't quite get that before they were almost the Hun in the first episode Mm -hmm. but by the time you get to the the third episode you're seeing wait a minute there's more here and I think that's a that's the writing but it was also the actors that that pull this off and I think the good writing plays to the strength of their actors. When you've yeah. got somebody like Michael and Sara, who actually played Kang two more times, late, much, much, much later, yeah. uh, it, all of a sudden you've got this creation that just kind of sits on the shelf. And for, th- throughout the 70s, you, you, you have this mythos of the Klingons. It's really not much. It's just they're the bad guys. I even had a copy of the Klingon joke book in the early 80s, which, <laughs> uh, which, which I bought at a convention, actually. And basically, it's all the, all the stupid people jokes you've ever heard about. You know, how do you know a Klingon has been on your computer? The whiteout on the monitor? That's that sort of thing. That sort of thing. Uh, that's where the Klingons were uh, until 1979, when with the Star Trek movie, they all of a sudden had a budget, so they actually made the the brow ridges and the militaristic samurai bushido type look. Mm-hmm. That was a turning point. It wasn't the big turning point, but it's one of the turning points. Uh, James Doohan actually created the the guttural language they used there's only five words spoken in that in klingon spoken in that movie and they're very brief they're very clipped they're very uh not much but he's the one that kind of came up with the sound yeah and from that point they just kind of sat there and people go huh what and then in you flash forward again four years later you've got star trek the search for spock with Christopher Lloyd, John Larroquette, and an actor whose name I cannot remember who played Torg. All of a sudden, you've got a language because they've written a language. They hired Mark Ockrand, uh, a linguist himself, to create the actual Klingon language. Uh, and then all of a sudden, the, the Klingons turn again. Yeah. And they're a little bit more human, believable. Well, they yeah, have motivations there's now. There's a motivation behind Yeah, That's right. Well, there's depth. You know, they, that's yes, it. That's exactly they, right. They, they, they move from being the cookie cutter bad guy to a a, a a bad guy with with some depth and some trying to figure out the motivation and um yeah that's that's the neat part when you think about whether these Star Trek movies became money makers mm-hmm. and they're kind of like well okay well what do we do well sideline Gene Roddenberry was. Was part of it. That's <laughs> correct. First because, on the agenda. Well, that's true because Roddenberry did not want to do Klingons again because he said, we've been there, done that. Well, yeah, when they're cookie cutters, I can see that. Yeah. But he didn't realize, you know, take what you've got and truly develop them. Yeah. Uh, and, and that and made a big difference. That was the thing with, with uh, Wrath of Khan is, is okay, well, we had this great villain from Space Seed way back when. Yep. Let's, what would have happened? Uh, and make it back into an adventure story. And it, of course, blew everybody away. It, yeah. it changed everything. Yeah. And then I says, well, why can't we do something with Klingons? We've got these yeah. Klingons out and there. The they were movie. originally meant to be Romulans, by the way, in the early drafts, yeah. which are not as interesting. I think yeah, they made see, the right choice. that's the thing. Romulans were. When that's Next right. Generation came around, they swapped the roles. The right. Romulans were originally the ones that we saw as having honor. Right. Uh, you know, they were, I mean... We they, just did the episode on Rome. Yeah, they were quasi ago. Romans. Yeah, yeah. I mean, their planets are Romulus and Remus. Hello, That's, you can't get any more direct. Yeah, these are Romans. Based, these, these these are Romans <laughs> on steroids and stuff. Right, and, and we might do a Romulan episode. That's kind of cool because they're very different. Right. but they're not but, as fun as Klingons. But now they've turned into the the you know sneaky backstabbing, uh, totally without honor. Uh, uh, Bad guys that they really—I mean, they were bad guys in the original right. series, but 
you know, they have swapped places. Right. Because if you're going to create, and this goes back exactly to the Klingon culture, if you're going to make the Klingons honorable, making the Romulans dishonorable creates the tension that you need. Because right. that's, and that's, and that comes later. That's, that's next generation stuff. And I think the reason that they swapped out, at least in the next generation, Romulans for Klingons has nothing to do with anything other than this. And that is that they didn't want to put another Vulcan-looking person on the bridge of the Enterprise. That's right. And that's why we didn't get Romulans in the next generation. Yeah. Otherwise, I think you would see a reversal of how we yeah. view the two races. In, in fact, Romulans were late to the party in the next generation. Yeah. They, they were the very, last, almost the very last It episode. was the last episode of the first season. And they came back. And as Marina Sirtis has said many times, they came back in that episode and they go, we're back. And she says, so what? Because <laughs> it didn't really do much they for them. They didn't carry it forward. They didn't carry much forward. But because you didn't have their continuing presence for yeah. much. Uh, it, it got better. It got yeah. a lot better. But Klingons really... Uh, with all great appreciation for the writers of Star Trek Three, and for Christopher Lloyd in particular, you know they say uh, badassery is built into them. That's I think one of the one of the things that makes them so compelling. Mm -hmm. uh, you basically you remember when they board the Enterprise? There's only like a dozen of these guys, and it says they outnumber us, my lord. We are Klingons, he says. And, of course, they go and get themselves blown up because, hey, this is James T. Kirk they're going up against. No contest. But it makes for a great story. Yeah. That's the template that's kind of, everything has changed for that. Flash forward four years to the next generation. And they're like, you know, we've got this guy. Worf did not, Roddenberry did not want Worf on, on the bridge of the Enterprise. He didn't, want to, he didn't want to play on character at all. He said, I don't want to do this again. They convinced him otherwise. And Michael Dorn had a lot to do with that because when they cast him for that, they were able to make this all work. So in many respects, the Klingon culture was handed to Michael Dorn and the writers that worked around him, most of which were Ron, Ronald D. Moore yes, uh, eventually. Ronald and Warren. we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. Yeah. But the real moment, we talked about this in the show prep, where everything changed. We've kind of built to this. And it's good. Everything that's been around, you know, we've got these moments uh, that are really kind of cool. We don't. We build on those. We don't repudiate them. Uh, Samurai Bushido was kind of the thing that we started with, but we really crystallized it in the first season of Star Trek: The Next Generation. And you might remember the episode "Heart of Glory." Uh, Maurice Hurley's the guy that, and he was doing a lot of the writing at the time that kind of did this. Uh, and it was basically Worf's first episode, his real episode. He's been yeah, nothing but a I, background character yeah. at this point. Something to to feature him. That's right. Because you have to do that in a first season. You've got to. You've got to do something that features each each of character. Every every character kind of get gets kind of gets their them. moment to to, to yeah. build into them. And this was Worf's, and it changed everything. And it was basically about the Klingon renegade chorus, played by Vaughn Armstrong, who was one probably one of the most prolific character actors in Star Trek franchise because he played dozens. <laughs> actually, he uh, you might know him best as Admiral Forrest. In Enterprise, because that was his longest recurring role. I mean, he did that one for four years, on and off, all the time. But this was one of his early ones, and he and he he and Worf are at odds about what does it mean to be Klingon. And by doing this, the audience gets a window into what they are, and they go for broke here. They actually put it down. You can you can trace it back to the final confrontation between the two of them, and chorus. Uh, you know, has is telling us, you know, join me, go out, and let's we'll write legends together, and you know, we'll change the world with we'll the universe, make everything the way it should be, and Worf very clearly, and Michael Dorn sells this very well because this is one of his earliest role, earliest episodes, and he says, you know, you speak of glory and conquest and legends we will write, but in all that you say, where are the words duty, honor, loyalty? Without which a warrior is nothing. It's a little bit of a imitation of yeah, Michael, Michael Dorn's performance, but ultimately that's what it is. Yeah. Th that though that line, that one line, changes everything because now all of a sudden this quasi Bushido looking race now has adopted the Bushido code in many respects. Yeah, but there's a glimpse into motivation. That's exactly well, right, and so, I think really. It, it, I would go so far as to say that they did not adopt it. What they have done is they have set up the tension for Worf's entire uh, character arc. Right. Because they have not adopted it. What they have done is shown how, how Worf, Worf adopted holds it. Yeah. to the ideals uh -huh. of 
a race that he did not grow up among. That's right. right. That's we were talking key. about that. That's he the holds key. out those ideals as the good and the perfect. Because and he want that's what he wants his people to be. That's right. He wants to be part of that. Yes. He doesn't want to be part of anything dishonorable. That's correct. Uh, that he probably did learn from his human parents. If you want to go into you know theoretical motivations yes. and all this in this in this yeah. fictional character. Yeah, and again, Keith, but, yes, yes, we're talking about all this like it's real, but uh, it is a, a creation of writers, and in you know you have to be careful with that because writers change and. Yeah, that's people, right. But people if producing shows come and go, but keepers are the characters, though. Yeah, and it, the beauty it, of this is consistency Michael Dorn runner, has played the character. Yes. You know, and in fact, he's a ton of credit goes to Michael. Well, Dorn. that's correct because he's the keeper of the character, and ironically, he has played the Wharf character. He has played is the most reoccurring character in all of Star Trek. Yeah, he yeah. has appeared in more episodes than any other. Uh, character, yeah. period. Yeah, well, joining DS9 and, and getting well, that's four correct. years it, out of it, that it, helped. It, it, that's correct. It did. <laughs> yeah. But there's a reason that they wanted to do that. There's a yeah, reason. He was a very that. popular character. Yeah, a very popular character. And it's because of this crucible that we talk about. This dichotomy, there's that word again, uh, this this tension we have between the ideal and, right. and reality. Right, because you, Robert, you were hitting on that. And that, to me, that's the whole, the whole piece that makes it fun is... Yeah. Um, Worf is actually separated from his culture. The the backstory of the character, if you're not familiar, his family is destroyed at the Kinemer massacre. That's right. Uh, the another Klingon's father betrayed the Klingon people to the Romulans, and the Romulans paid him back by destroying the the Kinemer outpost. Which Worf is thought to be the only survivor. He's a young child. Yeah. He's One adopted, uh, adopted by human parents, and actually grows up on Earth, and joins Starfleet. the Starfleet and join goes to this academy and becomes an officer. And therefore, his conception of his culture is really limited by what his parents, his adoptive parents, the Rojinkos, tell him. Yes. And what and he, learns, course, on his, and what he yeah. learns on his own as he grows yeah. up. But Separated. It, He's yeah. never, never part of And of course, of it. they're only going to tell him the good parts. Right. right. <laughs> well, sure. So, I mean, think of it as if you were separated from America and you're, whoever you are with, some kind of adoptive family, only tells you the great things about America, yeah. which there are a lot of, uh, but then you find yourself deposited on the street in New York City uh -huh. and now you're struggling to figure out, well, what does it really mean to be an American? Right. He's in the same boat, right. struggling to figure out what it means to be a Klingon, and he has this very idealized... Right. Because it's, it's, it's everything to him. It's his quest in yes. life. Yes. And that's, that's the character development yeah. here is, this is not just something that happens. He seeks it constantly. He is, yeah. he, he's, the, he's the orphaned child searching for his home. I, have, I got a better one for you. Okay. Give, right. give it, give it. Uh, bring it on. Because you're going to love this. He is the Thomas More of the Klingons. Oh, Really? Because he has that personal ideal, uh -huh. that personal truth, yes. that standard, and he, for him, it is true with a capital T. That's right. And he will not deviate from that no matter what happens to him, even when he is ejected from his society. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he does not give it up. And more importantly, he wants to hold all the rest of them to that same That's truth. That's right. And that comes in it. later in Deep Space Nine yeah. when he is immersed in, at the highest levels of the Klingon political structure. Uh, because of all that happens, you know, he helps put the, the chancellor on the throne in in the next generation, and that pays enormous dividends yeah. because now he has the ability to interact at the highest, what should be the ideal levels of the society he reveres, and he comes into great conflict because his ideals he will not he will not compromise. Yeah. He's very disappointed when he comes into contact with Gowron, in actual the, real Klingons. That's right, Duras, Gowron, and many yeah, of the others. They're, characters, they're, they're dishonorable. That's right, and and he is. They're no different than anybody else. Yeah, and, and he give, he pays them the they, highest of insults. He calls them "You are worthy of Romulans." Because he, hey, they killed his family. They killed all this stuff. Uh, there's nobody worse than Romulans, and this yeah. and that's another thing yeah. uh, that goes into his character. Well, that you I think see. Robert said it, but you know, people are people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, essentially, and I think that's, that's part of what makes the story work for yes. us. That's yeah, right. He's infused with humanity, right? And that's leading him to and hold way, his people to the highest right. standards of what it's supposed to be their creed. Um, yeah, you know, part of that's also the the 
the idealized world of, of Star Trek and the Federation, you know, it's this perfect society that nobody needs money because we don't, you know, that's so crass and, you know, that's just so 20th century. So Ferengi. So Ferengi. And yet, you know, people operate restaurants. I don't know, you know, what, you do that out of the goodness of your freaking heart, you know? <laughs> oh, that's right. That's yeah. hard work, man. Yeah, yeah, well, sure. yeah. yeah, well, you know, well, you know, and we get a little of, you know, pushback on that in Deep Space Nine because the character of Quark is a stand-in for all that capitalistic uh, attitude that we often have, both good and bad. And yet he's one of the best characters they yes, ever created. That is exactly right. And, and, I'll, and a lot of credit goes to Armin Shimmerman and uh, Max Gronacek. Uh, and all those actors who played the Ferengi in that series over and over and over again yeah. because they really hu- they humanized them too and recognized they're not that different from us and yet they are and that's what's cool. Yeah. So, but you know, there's a couple of things that I always found fun about the way Klingons were portrayed and, and the small decisions that they made in the show to make those characters fun. You know, originally... They weren't going to have Picard know a lot about Klingons, right. but he. But Patrick Stewart said, "No, I think it'd be better if he knew some of the language." Right. So in Sins of the Father, yeah. my favorite episode, right, um, third season, yeah, Worf asked Picard to be his Chadich, yes, his second, his uh, his representative to the Council during what essentially is a criminal trial, right. Um, and Patrick Stewart said, "No, no, I'm going to do the whole line." Yeah, and the line of Jalashness, Jis gets Judney Judge. That's a close pronunciation. That's right. That's very good. That's a very good. Uh, right. Nobody's going to know the difference. Nobody's going to know the difference. And uh, that's uh, I accept. Uh, I accept with honor. Right. And may your enemies tremble before you. Right. And and this that's such a great little encapsulation of what's fun about. The Klingon characters. Oh, yeah. It, and it forever cements Patrick Stewart's Picard character into the Klingon culture, yeah. which pays you know pays off in future episodes. Yeah. So basically, Patrick Stewart's insistence changed the course yeah. of what, of what he, went. He became, he yeah, became a part, significant part of figure. Part the fun of it. And, and that's just, to me, that, that's... That's good writing. That's this... We must act with honor. We must act with, with fortitude and courage. And if we do that, we're undefeatable. Right. It's, and that that's the appreciation for me that in the Klingon culture is it's a it's a bravery but not a uh what's the right word? It's it's not a it's not a boasting, it's not it's a not bravado. It's not bravado. It, it's a calm bravery through uh and that's the well, it's through adversity. Like, yeah, it's like in as you say, it's kinda of like Thomas Moore who's basically saying, I know that I'm right. I have to be. And that's kind of the way this works. Is Which it? sometimes can be act. seen as pure arrogance, but right? But you know, Moore was right. But when it's but it's <laughs> right. But, but but you know, he's basing that. Both of them are basing that on things bigger than themselves. Yeah, this is not just me saying I want it this way. And that's kind of what we're talking about here. Is yeah. there's actually some heft and some meat behind this yeah. that matters. Yeah. And that's that universal truth we always seem to quest after. Yeah, I'd say Klingons, as they eventually came to be. The ideal that, that Worf held them up to is a universal ideal. Yeah. You know, duty, honor, loyalty. strength, loyalty. All of these things are universal goods. Right. And it's not just... Except when duty to, you know, duty, honor, and loyalty to things that are wrong. But that was Worf's point. You know, they're about... You're, you're supposed to have duty and honor about things that are good. Right. And that's a given. It was not, you know, the state... Or the individual right or wrong. It's no, the state and or the individual must be right. Uh, and it's it's not a statist approach. It's not an individual approach. It's both, but it's it's a quest for virtue. Again, it's I go back to the to the Roman Republic. It's not about the state. It's about the people. That's right. Yes, doing doing the right thing by others. Right. And yeah. and that so and the state must follow that. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's yeah. the yeah. state is subordinate to that. To that. And answer, that's what Warp is trying a, to put forth. That's the key idea of the state and being that's subordinate. what we get. Yeah. That's what we like. We're saying, you know, yeah. uh, Worf would never, you know, he's, he is probably the, he's an ideal himself. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Flawed though he may be. Yeah. Because he can be pretty stubborn at times. Yeah. So, fellas, we're at about 25 minutes, so I want to get final thoughts on what you appreciate about the culture of 
as portrayed through uh, Michael I, Dorn. And, I think I just did. It, you know, yeah. It's the universal appeal for what he stands for. Yeah. You know, that's not a Klingon thing. That's that's a people thing. It's a human thing, obviously. Uh, it's it's something that everyone should be able to aspire to. You know, unless you're a flaming idiot, but you know that's another thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that the writers did a wonderful job of blending these two things into a, a really great character. Mm-hmm. Well, I think another thing too that we cannot cannot forget is Klingons are about strength too. This is not some watered down kumbaya type of culture here, where we're just doing the right thing because we're good people. No, we are strong. And good. These are not mutually exclusive. We have to be able to stand forth and scream to the universe, we are right, and we will do everything we have to do to make you understand that. And with the moral fortitude, there's a good word I think for that, that they have in doing so. They, they know, you know we are holding ourselves and you to a higher standards and, we're will, and we are doing so from a position of strength. That is, there's the difference between, you know, they are not a society of intellectuals, they're a society of warriors. Because yeah. they recognize that if you hold high ideals, you must work to make them happen. And you have to be able to defend them. That's correct. Yeah. So, listeners, I'll just, if you're not familiar with all this and you're wondering what we're on about, and you actually manage to stay with us for the whole 25 minutes and go, okay, sell me. There are five episodes of Next Generation that I love that are that are the main early on Worf arc, and that's uh, the Emissary, Sins of the Father, Reunion, and Redemption One and Two. And that's that whole story arc of him yeah, from trying to redeem his culture, and and it's got a lot of terrific performances. Susie Plaxon mm-hmm. plays Kalar, uh, and and mm-hmm. there's. Uh, Robert Riley, or yes. Robert Riley, that's Robert right. Riley is Gowron, Gowron. Gowron. and he's also a long-running awesome character. Awesome performance. Yeah, Barbara and, March plays Lursa in that. She just died, actually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is a, it's a shame. Then, she does a great uh, performance in that. You know, several a of those great episodes. conflict with uh, Duras, one, another great Star Trek villain. Um, so that's that's what it's you a need good to get entry into. into it. If you really wanted to immerse yourself well, you know, watch the. It, it, they actually. They span three years. They're spread yeah. out over the series. So find those five episodes on your favorite streaming platform and, and give them a watch and have some fun. And then you'll know what we've been talking yeah. about. Yeah, you can watch all those in an afternoon. Thanks for being with us here every week at Snakes and Otters, a pointless discussion of eternal questions. Be sure to spread the word on your social media accounts. Follow us and retweet us. We are on Instagram and on Twitter at Snakes and Otters. Let your friends know that they can find us on Podbean, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, and on YouTube. Just search Snakes and Otters Podcast to find us. And please, remember to leave us your comments and reviews. It helps people find us. And you can always send us an email at snakesandotterspodcast at gmail.com. I'm Martin. I'm Robert. And I'm Francis. Catch us next week. Same snake time, same otter channel. <laughs>